did you get the name Fearless? <laughs> <laughs> I attend a church here in Baltimore, Grace Bible Baptist Church, and one of our church members mentioned that she had an uncle named Freddie Water. And I said, I said, did you say Freddie Water? And she said, yes. I said, you mean like U.S. submarine captain, Freddie Water? And she says, yes, how'd you know? Nobody knows that. I said, oh no, and to the contrary. He's the ultimate submarine warrior from World War II. He's, he's just it. So I, I recall this one uh, chief petty officer would serve with him and the Sea Wolf during the war referred to him as a, that was Fearless Freddie Warder. Fearless Freddie Warder was coming to take, take, take over. You know, here, uh, bordering up in rural West Virginia at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, could go and, you know, become a very distinguished <laughs> Uh, um, submariner. He believed that your enemy is also your brother. And I, I just, I'm impressed by, you know, to be able to say and feel that, believe that at a time like, you know, in the war. When people think of <laughs> a bonsai American naval uh, Submarine Captain Freddie Warder is, Warder is the man that absolutely comes to mind. So it seemed to me that Fred fought with men the way he fought the war. You know, he was the little guy that had to get the big guy and he had to get him with one punch and knockout. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Well, the instructions that, that came out um, from um, the commander of the Pacific Fleet was, uh, first off, it was the announcement that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and the only instructions they gave was conduct yourself accordingly. And then um, uh, shortly after, a message came out and says, uh, uh, saying, um, engage, attack, uh, and sink uh, all enemy shipping uh, encountered. And that was it, very simple back in those days. The United States had already um, tried to stop the Japanese from uh, colonizing and, and invading the mainland of China and Korea, a lot of misbehavior by the Japanese Empire uh, in these areas that they quote unquote colonized. They basically invaded them and abused the, the citizens of the nations of Korea and, and China. I have always been interested in the, in the naval war between the United States and Japan, and uh, as an adult I started reading every book I could find specifically on submarine warfare, because early on, all we could afford to do was basically uh, attack Japanese supply shipping. I, I, most people don't know this, but the vast majority of tonnage that was sunk during World War II, enemy Japanese tonnage, was done by the submarine fleet, this, what's known as the silent service. These men paid the ultimate price, but f something like 55% of all uh, surface supply shipping to the Japanese, both war shipping and merchant marine, were sunk specifically by uh, submarines. So these guys, to me, are the heroes. They were a very small, efficient crew that punched way beyond their weight. Freddy was uh, uh, the oldest of uh, my Uncle Hugh's family. Uh, they had eight children, and he was the oldest. And Freddy was. Uh, uh, always did quite well in school, and he uh, was valedictorian of his high school graduating class. His first cousin, Uncle Charlie's boy, was uh, number two in the class, and, but Freddie, Freddie was number one. I just know that he, you know, if there was going to be a brawl, <laughs> Fred was going to, you know, punch out the, the biggest man in the room, and he was going to hit him good the first time so he didn't have to go back. Fred wasn't that big. You know, and his brother, Frank, was big and uh, he had broad shoulders and he was, you know, it looked to me like he was at least a foot or maybe more taller than Fred. Fred was not huge 
and he was very wiry, but Frank was big, and, and Frank was an FBI agent, and <laughs> Fred just knocked him out. <laughs> He got that first punch and that was it. And Fred was gone and Frank was down and out. And my mother said um, to my father, John, why do your relatives always have to pass out in our room? And my father said, pass out nothing. That's a KO from Fred. <laughs> it was. He knocked him out. So it seemed to me that Fred fought with men the way he fought the war. You know, he was the little guy that had to get the big guy and he had to get him with one punch knockout. I knew that he... Uh, was the cousin who was uh, had gone on to the Naval Academy and because uh, my Uncle Hugh, who was a state senator, was uh, able to get him a, a Naval Academy uh, appointment. Fred Ward is one of the most interesting to me submariners of World War II. He had a great history. Um, he was born in 1904 in Grafton, West Virginia and he got appointed at the ripe age of 18 to the U.S. Naval Academy and attended there. He was, the nickname he had was Freddy and Peanuts. I'm not sure why, but they called him Peanuts. I remember him as always had, having a big smile. Always, uh, he had a quick wit about him. Uh, his mother was Irish, you know, and uh, and he would make uh, jokes about Catholics, and uh, even though he was a Catholic himself, and because of her. And but it was a, he, he always had a good joke and a, a very affable guy. That's what I remember most about him. It was how easygoing, how fun he was to be around. No one in our family ever called Uncle Fred fearless or Freddy. He was known as the Admiral, Uncle Fred, Fred. And when my grandmother was feeling particularly stern, Frederick, <laughs> especially when he was teasing her about drinking or about being Catholic or something. In the late 1920s, Fred went to the submarine school in New London, Connecticut. And after that, he was junior officer on a number of US Navy submarines. And in 1939, he was the commanding officer at the commissioning of the USS Seawolf and remained commanding officer of the boat until 1943. Um, war clouds started gathering around 1940 and his submarine was sent to the Pacific and eventually to the Philippines along with a number of other U.S. submarines. And um, at the time he was uh, anchored out in Cavite Harbor in the Philippines there, near Manila uh, waiting to go in uh, for a um, repair job. It was the 8th of December then because he was on the west side of the, the, the International Date Line. It was 7 December at Pearl Harbor, but it was um, 8 December for him. Tell me, tell me this, uh, was the idea that you were going to surround the Philippines and, and uh, intercept invasion forces? I think it was. Uh -huh. uh, I was the first one to report ready to go to John Wilkes on the afternoon of the 7th of uh, December, whatever the hell, 8th of December, I guess it was out there. Um, and he gave me an operation, or it was the first one I've ever had. He said, go to Albe Gulf, which is east of Luzon, yeah. and resist Japanese landings. I had to go out of there with a convoy at night. His submarine was at um, the Cavite Naval Yard in Manila Bay in the Philippines on December 8, 1941, when the Japanese attacked the Philippines. It, they destroyed a couple of submarines not too far away from him. Uh, he got her underway and left Manila Bay and was sent on patrol in the northern Philippines off the coast of Luzon, the east coast of Luzon, near a town called Apari. Uh, and, um so immediately uh, he came in, he got what he needed, uh, and um, he began his war uh, primarily uh, as, a, as a transport, as moving uh, materials, uh, very dangerous materials around. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the comments he made uh, one time was that um, uh, he was so loaded up with ammunition, 50 caliber and uh, the other things that the people sure would need. He said he was afraid if a depth charge went off, he says he would go off like a great big hand grenade. He attacked the Japanese ships uh, in 
mid-December 1941, and then was sent down to Darwin, Australia, and they sent him back to the Philippines with, uh, they took a lot of, they took 16 torpedoes out of Seawolf and filled up the spaces with 50 caliber machine gun bullets and three inch uh, artillery shells, which Fred was not happy about. He'd really rather go sink ships than be a delivery truck. But he went to Corregidor, surfaced in the middle of the night, the ship was unloaded, he managed to get some torpedoes that were at Corregidor and some a, a, a lot of spare parts, submarines parts that had been saved from um, the Cavite Navy Yard, which the Japanese mercilessly bombed. And he took 25 passengers back to back south to Surabaya, and uh, then he continued to patrol, do war patrols, out of the Surabaya area for the rest of 1942. He um, saw a destroyer outside of Pari, the harbor there, and he went to attack it, but then he stumbled on a seaplane tender that was in the harbor, and he decided to uh, attack that. And he got a really good, he made a really good approach, he had everything all set up, he fired four torpedoes from his forward tubes, and none of them exploded. So he turned tail because the destroyer was going to come after him, and, but they set up four stern tubes to fire at the seaplane tender, and they fired those, and none of those exploded. And the only thing that exploded that day was Fred Warder, who was furious about the bad torpedoes, and that became a scandal during World War II that for the first couple of years of the war, their torpedoes did not work reliably, and he was just fit to be tied about that. I let this buster have four from the bow tubes, which is all I had, in the bow. And then I turned around and let him have a four from the stern tubes. And uh, my sound man reported explosions to the sky. But apparently the only good I did was to get one dud into that ship forward of the gangway on the starboard side. I still remember that. And these are the commencement of many heartbreaks. I mean, uh, how, did, how in the world did they expect to defend the Philippines with submarines? Oh, I don't see how they could. Now, if we had a good torpedo, mm -hmm. if we'd had torpedoes, we, uh, we could have made a damn fun effort. But we did not have the good torpedoes. Now, maybe the strategy thought we had, but we didn't. So uh, Admiral Warner knew that the torpedoes were not working well. So he actually went into a place called a Davao Gulf, and there was a ship that was anchored there <laughs> and with, it, with its periscope raised uh, and guys shooting at him, uh, shooting at that periscope. I don't know what they, what they expected to do with it, but they were, they were Fire. But he was firing torpedoes at this ship, and uh, he was uh, taking periscope uh, pictures, uh, and he had a record. And uh, of course, uh, they, they recorded the sound and so forth. So one of the torpedoes went under the ship. Okay, went up on the beach and exploded. So that was one. You see, it's not my fault. It's torpedoes' fault. And then um, he fired two more, and it was thud, thud against the side of the, the, the ship, and uh, they didn't explode. So that 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 kind of confirmed that. And then. Um, uh, another one he fired, and uh, it was a uh, an erratic run called a circular run. Uh, the torpedoes back in those days uh, were straight running, uh, and um, which meant that the rudders were either right or, or left full all the time. Well, if the uh, steering mechanism had a problem, the uh, the, the rudders going to lock over in one position. It makes a circular run, and the circular run would bring it right back uh, to about where the uh, machinery compartment is. It would blow, blow the ship up. We did lose a couple of submarines, by the way, but not. Uh, but, but not the Sea Wolf. Uh, uh, when Water uh, anticipated this, uh, and he had his sonar people listening, he knew it was a circular run. He went down, so the torpedo passed overhead and came back up again. And he fired a couple more torpedoes, and uh, he um, he finished the ship off. Early in the war, we developed a high-tech uh, sensing device on the front of our um, torpedoes. It was a proximity sensor, in in effect. And what it do, did it was it, it, it read the electromagnetic magnetic footprint around uh, the, the, sh the, the hull of a ship.
as the torpedo got closer and closer, it wouldn't, it wouldn't detonate until it had the highest reading of metal that it could read. In other words, it, uh, it might pass under a, a, a keel, but what it did was when it, it went, it, it, in, a, in a sense, it would be like a Geiger counter, which goes beep, 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 like this. And as it begins to go away, as the sound begins to drop off, the, the uh, torpedo would immediately detonate because it knew it was as close to the metal on that ship as it was going to get. And, and it was a brilliant idea. One problem, <laughs> these, these uh, torpedoes were tested, the proximity sensors were tested in Connecticut, which is where the, uh, the, submarine, the main submarine base is in the United States. And they worked great there. We found out later in the war that they didn't work well around the equator and in the South Pacific. Uh, because instead of there being a, a tight, dense cone of metal, let's call it metal taste, around the ship that went down like this, instead it was quite flat and uh, the footprint of metal around the boat that the uh, proximity sensor picked up was large and widespread. So what was happening was an American torpedo would, would approach near a Japanese warship and then detonate far away because it was sensing a heavy metal presence and it would blow up, but it would blow up too far away to do damage to the hull. This happened over and over early in the war. He had, he had other assignments uh, and it was kind of like a convoy escort thing. Obviously it was pretty, it, it was, it was pretty obvious that um, they were not going to be able to hold the Philippines and stuff had to be uh, moved out of there. People. Uh, uh, ships, uh, so forth, and uh, there were not a lot of destroyers there to escort them. And the uh, submarines, uh, you know, did that did that part. Uh, they would, uh, you know, take these guys uh, out of uh, out of Cavite, out of uh, away from Manila, and then uh, you know dispatch them, all, you know, over the place. And the water's uh, job, primarily with other submarines, was to go out and look around and make sure that there were no uh, uh, nothing uh, that was going to interfere with them. What they did was um, the Japanese uh, preset, uh, if you've seen in the movies, they look like 55 gallon drums being rolled off the back of the tail of a Corvette or a destroyer. And they were just basically loaded up with TNT. They would drop to a certain predetermined level based on, and the sensor that was used was a depth sensor based on water pressure. And then they, they would just blow up. And if you had, if you're, uh, submarine vessel was nearby when one of those blew up. The shock was such that it could break open the hull or weaken it or, or wrinkle the skin and do all kinds of damage. The vast majority of, some, of anyone's submarines that were lost during the war were lost to depth charges. And you have to understand the ship. You have to understand all the little ways. The ocean is always trying to get in there. It's always looking for a path to get in. And of course, um, you know, submarines that uh, we have to take water in for, for certain things, get rid of it for, for others and uh, so on. Uh, you know, we use uh, air, we use pumps uh, and all the rest. So um, we have to understand uh, all that equipment. Uh, and in the event that there is a casualty, uh, then make the right decision as to how you're, how you're going to recover from that casualty. It, it was terrifying. If you're in, on board a sub, you have to wait in darkness. You can't say anything. You can't move. You have to uh, breathe the stale air that's on board your boat. You're underwater. There's a very good chance you're never coming up alive. Water starts, be, you know, things begin to spring uh, leaks. You've seen them in all the movies. Oh, good Lord. Uh, it's, um, you learn an awful lot about yourself. <laughs> It's not for everybody. The, the diesel boats, is, and that's what I, all my experience is, except on one ship. I was on a ballistic missile submarine one time, a nuclear power. Uh, but uh, the, the, you know, the submarines, uh, there is an old saying that you have room on a submarine for everything but a mistake. Uh, and um, but uh, it's awfully snug. It really is. Uh, and I know that uh, we we probably ate better than any other outfit in the Navy. But just walking uh, from one end of that ship to the other is, is like a, a, a trip to the gymnasium because you're ducking and turning and twisting and um, and of course uh, you know every uh, we have one passageway right so that uh, that means that everything um, uh, in order to work on it you, like for example let's say we have a a, a radar technician and uh, he has to work on the, on the radar transmitter we pull that transmitter out into the passageway right uh, and uh, he's. He's kneeling down over the thing, working 
you know, doing what he has to do to it. In the meantime, people are walking back and forth, stepping over him. So you, you must, you know, you must be adaptable down there. You know, you can't be annoyed by people, uh, uh, you know, get, getting in your way because you're every, your your way is going to be gotten into down there. Yeah, that's all there is to it. And we uh, long trip. We go out, uh, be, be out, be 70 days before we get back to port, and. Um, Cases of canned goods would just line the whole passageway from one end of the ship to the other, and we would walk on top of uh, the, uh, the, those cases of canned goods, and we'd just eat our way, you know, uh, through that, and just start disappearing one by one. It was very tight quarters inside those things. When they first went out um, on a tour of duty, you would load food <clears throat> on the deck on the floor, and they'd have to walk over bags of potatoes and onions and whatever else they're eating to get to their. Um, to get to their own um, bunks. He talked to me one time about um, depth charge evasion. Uh, and um, the way he, he put it to me is that, well, you gotta understand that what the, this Japanese destroyer, the enemy destroyer is doing, is he's uh, making a noise and, and, and he's listening for the echo. Well, uh, the more aspect that you show uh, that ship, uh, the, the stronger the echo. So basically what he would always do uh, is to turn and point directly toward the ship. And that gave him the most narrow aspect. And even though it meant that he was going right toward this guy that was trying to get him, uh, the uh, echoes were, were just not coming back strong. Uh, they would come back weak, which would indicate the, that the, uh, the submarine was much further away. So the guy would go uh, overhead and he'd go racing out there and bang, 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 the charges would go off. and. Um, and, the, and that's, that was the time uh, then he would make his, uh, his course change or maneuver in order to put distance between him and, the, and that destroyer. And, and that was very effective. He also uh, uh, was pretty tough on destroyers. The destroyers were the, the ships that were out there looking for submarines. Uh, the, uh, uh, they had nothing for search other than, than an act of uh, you know, echo ranging uh, type thing. And, uh, but of course, um, uh, if ever you fired a torpedo, the guy knew generally where you were, and then he would come over there and start, you know, banging on you with that sonar and uh, drop depth charges, and it was pretty bad. And again, that's how we lost most of our um, submarines in action against the Japanese was due to de the Japanese depth charging, and we did the same thing to them. The strategy the United States Navy had with our uh, submarine service was to go after the merchant marine because they were easy targets. They were soft targets. We could sink them. They couldn't fight back. It allowed our uh, American submarine fleet to last a little longer. It was, it's a little more dangerous when you go after a Japanese warship because they can fight back. And the most deadly warships were corvettes and destroyers because the destroyers are very shallow draft vessels. If you attempt to fire at a torpedo at a, at a uh, well, at least at a Corvette. A Corvette's even smaller than a destroyer. Uh, Corvettes are so shallow that submarine, the um, torpedoes go underneath. And you have to be a very good shot to take out a destroyer with a, uh, with a torpedo. The vast m majority of American submarine commanders wouldn't tangle with the destroyer, but that's not the case with Freddie Water. Submarine commanders were a breed apart. A lot of them had a strong streak of independence. They didn't like being pushed around by admirals and captains, you know, and the submarine service gave them that kind of freedom because when a submarine left port, they had virtually no contact with the admirals and the captains. It was all up to the submarine commander, uh, his crew, typically on a fleet boat, 80 men and officers. They were together in a steel tube for three months or more. They had to work closely together to make everything work, and particularly in combat. And that was all up to the, to the skippers. And I, I think, and Fred certainly exemplifies that role, but to have that kind of independence, they would occasionally pick up a radio message. They would get top secret intelligence through radio about, we believe there's going to be a convoy at this coordinate at this time on this day, and you should go there and just check it out. And that was called ULTRA. It was what the Navy called the Japanese um, de decoded messages. And, and mostly they'd go to that point and sure enough, there'd be a convoy they could, they could shoot at. But it wasn't, they didn't have anybody breathing down their necks. Um, they weren't part of a task force in the normal sense of the word. 
um, they were just all out by themselves. And I, you know, the, the submarine skippers really liked that aspect of what they did. We had U.S. sub captains. Toward the end of the war, we were running out of soft targets, Merchant Marine, and we started going after warships and even going after destroyers. Now, imagine a Japanese destroyer no, uh, seeing that American subs are coming after him. That, that's really demoralizing because you're supposed to be the one scaring the subs. It got so bad that uh, there would, um, toward, this is toward the end of the war, when the Japanese no longer had air, air supremacy also, um, American uh, submarines would surface at the mouth of Tokyo Bay to try to lure the Japanese surface fleet to, to come out to them. You know, and uh, after a while, the Jap the, the, at first the Japanese would come chasing them out and trying to s s sink us, and we'd sink them. And after a while, they wouldn't take the bait anymore toward the end. It was just, uh, it was getting hard. By the end of 1944, it was very, becoming very difficult for the U.S. Navy submarine fleet to find targets to sink. That's a good thing for us. Really good thing. Captain Warder, um, Everybody was required to go on seven patrols. And generally the custom was to, for a, a captain not to press his luck. Just like in Vietnam, when a guy was down to his last month, he didn't go out on any scary patrols. You don't want to risk a guy's life. If he's made it through a whole year in Nam, you don't want to push your luck at the last minute. But Warder is Warder. And he's determined to make this very last of his patrols count. He was on his way back from the Palau Islands and he discovered another anchorage or an area where there was a tremendous amount of activity. He sailed in, he torpedoed, and he was able to sank, sink a 3,000 ton ship. Then he sank a transport. Uh, this is very valuable because not only is it tonnage, but it's Japanese fighting troops, men that will never make it to shore. And, in, and threaten American lives. A 7,000 ton transport. That was a tremendous prize that he got. Then again, he was able to torpedo, on it, again, on his, on his way coming home, he was able to torpedo another ship to the tune of 3,000 tons. So that means he, he sank 13,000 tons in one patrol. That's more than the majority of uh, sub-captains ever sank in their entire career of seven patrols in the South Pacific. Then he's on his way home and um, he's being chased by destroyers. So he goes deep, he comes up and he swings his periscope around. He sees the destroyers and he's a little worried. He swings the periscope around the other way and he finds one of the Japanese aircraft carriers, uh, either Shokaku or Zuikaku. They were both involved in the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, he does his best to stay alive, maneuver into place to sink this carrier. Un unfortunately, he's never able to quite get a bead on it to let a couple fish go. I, I, you know, I, I, and I'm sure that was frustrating to him because it would have been the, the crowning joy of his final patrol. Um, but he, uh, he has to submerge, he escapes from the destroyers, he's able to come back to Pearl Harbor. He makes a report of the sighting that he had of the carrier. And uh, the U.S. Navy follows up on that sighting because a submarine, in addition to attacking ships, if they can provide intelligence, is doing a great favor because they were the eyes, um, the deep water eyes for the U.S. Navy. Uh, because we could obviously we couldn't have surface patrol ships out there. They would have been caught by the Japanese off guard. But the warder to me is just the absolute quintessence of, a, of, a, of, of what a submarine commander should be. He never gives up. Even when his men are frayed to their edge, he feels like it's his duty. It's his calling to engage the enemy whenever possible. Don't come home with any... Uh, fish, don't come home with any unspent torpedoes uh, on your boat, and be able to come home with a clear conscience knowing you did your very best to serve your country. How Freddie Water got that name Fearless Freddie? He was the last boat out on patrol leaving the Java Sea area, very low on fuel, very low on food, provisions. Um, <laughs> the men were smoking uh, coffee grounds rolled in toilet paper because they'd been out of cigarettes for a while. 
Anytime you live on a submarine, it's under high stress. This was a very, very difficult time because they're low on fuel. They're low on torpedoes, but Freddie Warder wasn't about to go back to his base with unspent torpedoes. Ridiculous. He'd never do that. And he was a hard driving captain. He found out that there was, uh, that the Japanese had invaded Cri the Christmas Islands about 200 miles south of Java and he uh, took his boat down in that way. He decided he'd just patrol the area, cruise around, see what's going on. As he approached, uh, I think it was Flying Fish Cove, uh, that's the one where the Japanese uh, had their anchorage. Uh, it was an absolute submariner's dream. Four cruisers lined up in a row, lined up in a row. He slipped in there. It's very, very difficult uh, for a sub to approach most Japanese uh, moorings because they they used shallow moorings but Flying Fish Cove was a little deeper, a little easier for a submarine to get in so he wasn't going to pass up this opportunity. He got in close and uh, destroyers recognized him right away. He heard the pinging but he fired off four, I believe it was four torpedoes at a cruiser that was about a thousand yards away and that's that's a about as close as a submariner will ever want to get to his uh, to his target. So he fired these four torpedoes. He remained in position because he wanted to watch, he wanted to listen for the breakup of the of the ship. At the same time that he heard the destroyers pinging closer and closer to him. Well, as soon as he was convinced that he had sunk that ship, he he dove low and his logbook reports that uh, the Japanese were very effective in placing their depth charges. So he stayed low and he, he waited uh, uh, overnight. Uh, the next day, and he slipped out of the cove, the next day he slipped back in and the Japanese of course were alerted to him, they were on patrol, but he was able to maneuver in again and nail a second um, cruiser, struck a second cruiser, uh, and, and, and again, he's being chased by the destroyers. He had to go deep. And again, he was uh, depth charged, uh, fled the area, waited until later on that afternoon, he came back in and he struck a cruiser a third time. This man, man had uh, an incredible opportunity and more than luck, he seized every opportunity that he could. Captain Water comes in the very next day again because he wants to finish off this juicy collection. He's down to just two torpedoes left. They're on attack mode now because they're just absolutely patrolling the area. The water's boiling with ships going back and forth looking for him. He slips in because he's determined to use up his last torpedoes. There's one more cruiser left. It's flying the, the pennant of the Admiral of the squadron. He says, I'm gonna take this guy out. So he fires his last two torpedoes at the cruiser and he hits them. But in the meantime, uh, the destroyers got perilously close to him. He dove down deep and he endured nine hours of depth charge from multiple patrol boats, corvettes, destroyers. Unbelievable. I, that may be the record for the United States Navy for this submarine fleet. Enduring nine hours of well-placed depth charging. And he says in his logbook, he says, my men were really at the end of their rope and he realized he had to go and there's no point in staying around. He had no more torpedoes. Um, there's no more point in him uh, doing any more intelligence in the area because he's already taken out all four of the capital ships that were anchored at Flying Fish Cove and he returned home in victory and on the way the men said I'm gonna call you Fearless Freddy from now on after what we saw you do. I think Freddy Warder more than any other um, submarine captain probably more than any other uh, naval officer in World War II uh, just demonstrate an absolute fearlessness um, that, uh, that, that no one else could answer. And you have to remember, when you're the uh, commander and you're that fearless, you're taking your men with you. And he had to convince and motivate his men to be willing, as I said, to go to the gates of hell with him to do what needed to be done to stop the, the Japanese uh, surface Navy. And he was willing to do it, and they were willing to follow him to do it. So they had the utmost trust and confidence in him. And sometimes, in, in a sense, that sort of confidence is suicidal because their determination is whether we live through this or not, we're going to take out these Japs.
they're not going to make it back home alive. He later came back uh, as what they call a, a division commander or a wolf pack commander. And that was after he was relieved by uh, Lieutenant Commander Royce Gross. The term wolf pack comes from the German Rudel tactic or wolf tactics, and which the Germans had developed quite early in the war and very effectively in the North Atlantic. And they would have uh, some wolf packs that would have 10 or 20 submarines all at one time, all converging on the same convoy, and they sunk hundreds, thousands of ships that way. And the U.S. looked at that, at that and said, well, you know, we got a bigger ocean, we got smaller convoys, but what can we do? Could three submarines working together in, in, in a coordinated attack do better than three submarines operating individually? When Fred was assigned to the Wolfpack, probably late September, early October 1943, he was a Commander, Submarine Division 122, based in Pearl Harbor, which means he, he, was, he commanded uh, uh, several boats. And so he was a, sort of a senior officer at that point. It was not on a, you know, he didn't go to sea. He was a desk jockey more than anything else. And the U.S. was developing wolf pack tactics at the time, and they were also planning Operation Galvanic, which was an attack in the Gilbert Islands, specifically on Tarawa, which became a really bloody place. And they wanted, the Navy wanted to prevent the Japanese from resupplying the Gilberts during the operation. So they began developing these tactics. It went through months of trials. And the object then is you have typically three submarines in, in the US Navy would go out and work together using the same intelligence, the ultra intelligence. And they would try to coordinate their attacks on a, on a convoy. Eventually it became a good tactic, these coordinated efforts, but it took a lot of work. And as Fred found out, the communications were really bad between submarines because they had no way to communicate between the boats, particularly when they were underwater. Um, and that they lost some opportunities on his wolf pack because of that, because not everybody knew what was going on. Two submarines might get the message and the other one like didn't and didn't have no clue what was going on. And and that happened frequently during Fred's Wolfpack experience. And he was it was something that frustrated him. So they sent a bunch of submarines out around the Marianas Islands and they said, well we need to have a wolf pack. We'll try that. Let's see what happens. We'll send a wolf pack. And so they brought in Fred, who had had no he had no role in the development of the wolf pack, so he didn't know a lot about it. And the guys, the one guy, Swede Momsen, who had pretty much single-handedly developed the early doctrine, was already out on the first war patrol that the Navy ever ran. Fred's would be the second. So they said, we're going to put you in charge as the Officer and Tactical Command, or OTC, and you will then devise a plan for the three submarines we're assigning you, Pargo, Snook, and Harder. And you will go and patrol the Northern Marianas and look for shipping to sink. Keep them from, keep them away from the Gilbert Islands. And so that was the genesis of his wolf pack. When Fred returned to Pearl Harbor with his wolf pack in December 1943, he wrote a report about everything that had happened and he gave some recommendations to the commander of submarines Pacific. And among them was the ships, our, all our ships, all our submarines should be uh, equipped with what's called IFF or identification friend or foe. Because at one point during his pack, they picked up radar signals from what they thought might be a Japanese vessel. And two of the boats converged toward that target only to realize that it was the other submarine. It was, I believe, Snook. So that was a, that's a dangerous situation. You don't want to be attacking your own forces. The American Navy had a pretty effective aircraft detection radar called the SD, and it worked pretty well. They could pick up aircraft, you know, far enough away to dive and evade. But it gave out emissions, radio emissions, and 
the danger in that was the Japanese could pick it up. So Fred, one of Fred's recommendations was when you're in the area, turn off your SD radar because you don't want the Japanese knowing you're there. And in fact, keep communications is to the absolute minimum because they might be able to use direction finding equipment. And it, even if they can't pinpoint where you are, if they know you're there, they can reroute the convoy. Another thing that Fred was not happy about was the lack of communications between the boats, like using radios. And he thought there had to be a better way. And that was a frustration shared by every OTC of every wolf pack up until at least the late, four, late 44, maybe 45, when some new technology was brought in that would make it more difficult for the enemy to figure out that the Americans were out in the waters. To benefit better communications between the submarines and the wolf pack, the um, command worked out a code, a two-letter code, which had a vocabulary of like, um, I'm turning left, I'm turning right, I'm diving, I'm surfacing. And they could, by sending out just two letters, Morse code, they could communicate quickly and probably not identifiably uh, with the other boats. Fred found that very frustrating. He said there's just not enough, there's not, there, there aren't enough words in the vocabulary to make it work. So he switched during the Wolfpack to something called the aircraft code, which was four letters. It was used by Navy pilots. It had been used by Navy pilots for years. And it had a much larger vocabulary. And it wasn't until a few months after Fred's Wolfpack came back that they developed, the Navy developed a far better two-letter code. Because obviously sending two letters is half the exposure to Japanese direction finding than four letters. Uh, and, and it became very effective after a while. And then Fred also said, you don't need a division commander running this operation. I'm, I'm superfluous. I, there's not much for me to do. I can, I can sit in the officer's mess and look at maps and think about stuff and, you know, listen to music. But you don't need a senior commander there. Let the senior officer, in other words, the most, by, by the seniority, all the Navy officers had ranked seniority, let the senior officer of the three boats be the OTC, and it'll just make everything a lot smoother. There's, then there's no interference from somebody else who doesn't necessarily know the situation the way the, the boat commanders do, and that was pretty quickly uh, employed by the Navy. They stopped sending division commanders out. He went into Christmas Island uh, because uh, they knew the Japanese were going to come there uh, in order to, uh, you know, take advantage of the potassium. At the time, they were nothing but, um, you know, aborig Aboriginal uh, people uh, that were there. And uh, to give you some feel for Abra Water, uh, uh, he got there before the Japanese did, and uh, there were facilities uh, there, uh, docking, that sort of thing. And uh, someone suggested that, well, maybe it's a good idea if we go in there and blow all that up. Uh, well, no, you got to understand these. This is a war going on. Uh, and these are just Aboriginal people. You would think that, you know, who, who, who really cares about them? Uh, Warder did. And he said, no. He says, we're not going to go in there and blow anything up. He says, because uh, these people need this to make a living there, and we don't want to hurt them. I guess later on, I, I learned from um, uh, the person who succeeded him in command of the, the Sea Wolf, uh, Royce Gross, uh, that he, uh, that he sunk a, uh, a, a Japanese merchant ship uh, not far from uh, that, that place uh, and um, uh, it went down there were two survivors in the water and the water wanted to bring them on board and one of them blew himself up with a hand grenade and the other was uh, he just refused to come because uh, the uh, the Japanese culture at the time you do not surrender you you died for the Emperor and the water figured he needed something uh, so um, he actually uh, he tossed him a life jacket and a, and a fifth of bourbon uh, the uh, Japanese acknowledged with a nod, and, uh, but uh, from what Water could tell that he was, uh, you know, uh, carried out to sea and ultimately was lost. When he was uh, patrolling down in the Java Sea area, he sunk a Japanese ship and he surfaced and discovered a lot of Japanese just floating in the water without life jackets. So he had the crew, his crew, throw as many life jackets as they could to help the survivor, the surviving sailors. Stories told that 
when Freddy sank a Japanese uh, warship or merchant marine that he'd go alongside and throw them life rafts, provisions, and whiskey to make life a little easier. If, if you're gonna eat, be eaten by sharks, at least you <laughs> wanna go down enjoying yourself, so. It was kind of fascinating. Uh, our family was pretty much uh, my mother and my aunt who were very influential in my uh, moral upbringing. Uh, uh, just hated the business of whiskey, and uh, so he would tease them all the time about, uh, you know, whiskey, and so that yeah, was one of these little jokes that he would do, knowing that they were very uh, pro, uh, you know, anti-whiskey. But he, he, was, he was quite uh, open about that he did enjoy liquor, <laughs> and just much to their disgust. And uh, we learned we learned a lot about his personality, about his uh, his compassion, uh, you know, for people. You know, it was kind of, think typical of kind of Fred's attitude toward the world, and he saw them as an enemy. I mean, the Japanese is truly an enemy because of what they had done, particularly at Pearl Harbor. But he believed that your enemy is also your brother, and I, I just, I'm impressed by you know. To be able to say and feel that, believe that, at a time like, you know, in the war. But he was so gracious, that's what I remember always, and uh, about him. And, and uh, those same traits that he developed in the Navy served him well in retirement. And, and I think it was the, um, I guess it traces back to, to what he showed when he, during the war. I mean, he, he considers every human being, uh, you know, a fellow uh, resident of this planet and uh, it deserves to be on this planet just as much as he does. Uh, and, uh, and that was the way he treated him with respect. And I learned that from him, and, and that, that served me very well in the years to come. I learned from him that it, it makes no sense to have an enemy. An enemy does you no good whatsoever. So it'd be nice to everybody, and uh, so I was, and it, it paid dividends. So he always had a good feeling about uh, these are people. That's what I liked about Fred. He was a people person, even enemies are, are people. <laughs> he went on to earn uh, two Navy crosses, uh, one uh, for the, uh, the cruiser action uh, that I mentioned to you, the, uh, the, the two cruisers sunk and, uh, and the, one, uh, the one damaged. And then um, he also uh, got a second, he got a, a star added to that in, in lieu of a, a second uh, Navy cross. Uh, for sinking a, a, a total of um, 190,000 uh, tons of uh, submarines, and that's our uh, surface ships, and that, that 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 is quite a record. Of course, he got a uh, Legion of Merit. He got two of those, uh, and then the dis descending, uh, you know, awards, so Navy Commendation Medal, Navy Achievement Medal, and uh, then the usual ones: the Victory Medal, uh, Philippine Service Medal, and uh, Asiatic Pacific Medal. My Uncle Fred had an amazing life. He grew up in rural, you know, in West Virginia. He went to Annapolis as a young man. And um, then he, you know, became captain of a submarine. And then he uh, was in charge of the submarine school. Um, he had the wolf pack. He uh, traveled all over the world. He traveled all over the United States. He was asked to speak numerous places. Um, he knew. I'm sure hundreds of people, um, and he was just a wonderful person. Everybody that met him liked him, as far as I know, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. He had a wonderful, full, and rich life, and I'm honored to know him. Uh, here, a boy growing up in rural West Virginia at the beginning of the 20th century uh, could go and, you know, become a very distinguished <laughs> submariner. I think he really did believe in a hard war and an easy peace. Um, he wanted the war to be fought hard and fast and be over with so that humanity could get back to being humanity because he, I never really heard him say an ugly thing about anyone. I never heard anyone say he said an ugly thing about another person. and. Um, the way he treated my elderly grandmother, my elderly aunt, um, my parents, 
Um, their brothers and sisters um, are my father's brothers and sisters. Um, he was just a lovely, lovely person. Um, he, um, he never forgot West Virginia. He never forgot to go home, up home, they called it. Uh, he, he always, whenever he could, he would write or he would visit. Um, he was just a lovely person. To be a successful captain, you have to have a crew that will obey you and you have to have a crew that respects you enough to risk their lives because he isn't called Fearless Freddy for nothing. He would take risks that almost no other submarine captain did. Well, some of them took risks and they just didn't live to tell about it, which is understandable. That's why they call it a risk. Um, but Freddie, Freddie er absolutely earned that title of being called fearless. He absolutely was uh, fearless. Um, and his men would go to the gates of hell and back for him. He had their utmost respect. I, do, I mean, you just really wanted him to be proud of you. Uh, you were proud to be with him and you wanted him to be proud of you when you were with him. And uh, he's one of my fondest childhood memories, actually. It was an honor to be around him. That's what I remember about him. And, and he, unpretentious, he didn't try to, he did have, carry a, you knew it was a, he had an American flag, I remember flying in his front yard, <laughs> always. And he was just gregarious and loving. He just, if you were with him, you just felt like you were the only person on earth. He really made people feel his warmth. And uh, other than, he just had a magnetism about him. I don't know what to say. If I had to go to war, I would want to be under Freddie Warder. Established in 1986, the Rear Admiral Frederick B. Warder Award for Outstanding Achievement recognizes a specific action, contribution, or continuing performance which most positively influenced the reputation, readiness, or future well-being of the submarine force. Lieutenant Commander Alstrom's sustained superior performance and his significant contribution to the mission of the submarine force make him most deserving of the Naval Submarine League Frederick B. Warder Award for Outstanding Achievement. The Naval Submarine League Outstanding Achievement Award is named for Rear Admiral Frederick Burdett Warder, USN retired. Admiral Warder was a true hero of the submarine service during World War II and a dynamic leader throughout his active career. As a result of his aggressive and innovative leadership during a war patrol, he was dubbed Fearless Freddy by his crew in Seawolf. He completed seven war patrols in command of Seawolf and is accredited with sinking eight Japanese ships totaling 38,900 tons. For his performance in Seawolf, he was cited for displaying great courage and leadership in the face of aggressive enemy advances. Later, he was assigned by Commander Submarine Force Pacific Fleet as the commander of the second Wolf Pack, with Snook, Harder, and Pargo in the pack. Their combined action sank seven ships. His wartime duties concluded with his assignment as Commander Submarine Division 122. From 1944 to 1946, then Captain Warder was commanding officer of the submarine school. Here again, the young submarine officer gained from his leadership and many of them became the first commanding officers of our early nuclear powered and ballistic missile submarines. Rear Admiral Warder's submarine career culminated in his assignment as Commander Submarine Force U.S. Atlantic Fleet, where his leadership was again felt as submarines moved into the era of nuclear power. Recipients of the Naval Submarine League Rear Admiral Frederick B. Warder Award for Outstanding Achievement can be justly proud to have this link with a courageous, aggressive, and innovative fighter who was esteemed by his crew and who contributed greatly to the advance of submarine warfare. And who contributed greatly to the advance of submarine warfare. The next award is the Rear Admiral Frederick B. Warder Award for Outstanding Achievement. This year's award is presented to Mr. Mark Cook, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, Portsmouth, Virginia. The Naval Submarine League Frederick B. Warder Award for Outstanding Achievement is presented to Mr. Mark A. Cook for service is set forth in the following citation. Mr. Cook's sustained superior performance and his significant contribution to the mission of the submarine force to make him most deserving for the Navy Submarine Frederick B. Warder Award for Outstanding Achievement.
you know, Fearless Freddy was his, was his nickname, uh, kind of similar to me. That's kind of the approach we took on our project, uh, that we wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, it seems from reading from him, that was his kind of style of leadership. Uh, uh, not afraid to take chances, uh, but also very uh, caring for his people. So for Admiral Warder, I kind of touched on this earlier. I think the most fascinating part for me is, uh, and it's kind of from, uh, I mentioned that my first submarine was the Sea Wolf. So we, uh, having one of the namesake, uh, sharing the namesake with Admiral Warder is definitely something uh, very cool to me. Uh, definitely the heroism and, and the gallantry he showed in his time during World War II. As the CEO of Sea Wolf, he is responsible for a number of, um, sinking a number of Japanese uh, ships, tonnage, if you want to look at it. I think it's some was a mix of military and, and civilian craft that he did. And uh, I do know that he is, is known for having um, been depth charged quite a bit. So he survived quite a, he and his, and his crew, I don't want to say that just he did, but he and his crew survived quite a bit uh, while they were over there in the, uh, in the Western Pacific operating. From what I've read in his obituary and been told by my father, Uncle Fred really didn't like the name Fearless Freddy because he was just as afraid as anybody else on the submarine and his crew. And his crew were his heroes, whom he fondly referred to as his beloved sons of you know what. And uh, he felt and said that the real heroes in war are those that give their lives. How'd you get the name Fearless? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't like it. Uh, one, I'm scared to death. Really. I mean, when I shoot torpedoes, I'm scared. 